Today is March 20th, 2019, and I'm interviewing Patrick Kiernan, the founder of Crocodorka Theatre Company. Thank you very much for meeting with me today. Very good, thank you. Can you tell me a bit about your background and how you became involved with, in theatre? Um, I, I suppose I wasn't really a theatre goer when I, I was young. Um, it wasn't something my family did really. And I, um, I, when I, was, like when I left school, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, uh, other than I, was, I used to play music, not very well, but I used to play playing bands. And uh, we were kind of uh, at one stage kind of determined to make make it as a band, which never happened. The band I was in, and uh, um, and I suppose after that, I suppose there was always some kind of latent interest in the arts in me, and I think I was I was very much into film, watching film, never inter interested in making film, but I. Um, through that interest and reading quite a lot and um, the first the real kind of theatre production I saw was a production of Borstal Boy, uh, Brendan Behan in The Gaiety in Dublin and I went to see that because of me and some of my friends were reading Brendan Behan and interested in it so that was the access into the theatre production but the theatre production itself then I found incredibly vibrant, interesting. I found the... It was a, so much better than I had expected it to be, having read the book. I didn't... I hadn't foreseen that I... that the medium of theatre, in what little expectation I had of it, would have been so interesting. So, I remember at the time then, I had a job um, repairing forklift pallets in um, coal yards and I saw a, an ad in for uh, Cork U Theatre where they were looking for actors and I think I was 20 at the time I think and um, I remember that the age range was 16 to 21 for the theatre, so I just about qualified, and there was an open day for it um, uh, 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 to meet. And I think it was a kind of a casting thing for this play called The Insect, played by the Campbell Brothers, some obscure Czech, Czech, Czech play. But um, so I kind of so that, that put me into the youth theatre, where I acted for some time. And then I, there was a very active drama society in the university in UCC, and they were kind of like an independent bunch of people in the university. In so far as that there was a theatre, the Granary Theatre, um, which was done by the Mercy Hospital. Uh, away off the campus even and, and you know so it, it felt those people had the run of it and they were really people who were doing other arts degrees but their focus was on making theatre it seemed and a lot of people subsequently from that time went on to become theatre makers professionally but um, even though I wasn't in university because I was acting in the youth theatre plays and there would have been some crossover that suddenly I was being cast in plays in the UCC um, and uh, and I suppose around that time as well I began to notice as an actor that I was kind of a little impatient with some of the decisions that were being made about the production that I may have been in and I began to think then that maybe I'd like to direct. So, so I began to direct both in the youth theatre and in UCC Dramatic. And uh, so there was a big bunch of us, I suppose it, it, it was, became more active in UCC as well then. And I, you know, that there was a, um, there's a national um, festival 
ISDA, it's called, the Irish Student Drama Association Festival. And each university picks two productions of their yearly output to go to that um, festival. And I, one, one that I had directed, Entertainment Mr. Sloan, a Joe Orton play, um, was selected. And subsequently, when it went to Trinity, to the festival, I won Best Director at the festival. But then it became common knowledge that I wasn't in university, so um, I wasn't, I shouldn't have been there, I shouldn't have won the award, and that put an end to UCC Dramat. I had passed the kind of, the window of the youth theatre at this stage as well. So I was about 22, 20, maybe a little bit older than that actually. And um, um, so then it was going, what are we going to do, or what was I going to do? But there were also other people, um, like Conor Lovett, who's a very thin, you know, very well regarded um, actor alongside with his wife, Judy, as a director that their company, Garson Lazar, now who kind of specialised in Beckett actually, but he and I were in the same situation, so he would have been in that play as an actor, and, uh, but basically, so the end had come for him in terms of our little home over in um, the Granary in terms of UCC. So we're kind of going, oh, what are we going to do? Um, so we decided we would set up a theatre company. And we set up Korkadurka, Judy's wife came up with the name, or uh, Connor's wife, Judy, uh, at now, she wasn't at the time, came up with the name. And um, so there were a bunch of us at that time who would have been in UCC, who were making work together, many of whom had subsequently finished university. So there was a kind of a resident pool or company of actors, designers, which kind of effectively continued on what we had been doing there. So, um, so it was, that was a very interesting time insofar as that everybody had such an appetite for it. I mean, there was no long-term policy or strategy for the work at that stage. Um, even though I suppose we were experimenting with space, and at that stage as well as I alternated between directing and acting in shows. So I remember um, like early shows that we did, the first one was Lance and Lena, a uh, Georg Buchner play, is that we did that in a kind of a, like a mini promenade in the granary, insofar as that the action took place all around and the audience were in the middle. And it alternated like that, and we did a that's going to Scapham and Moliere in the Cork Arts Theatre, and we reversed the seating arrangement for that so that the audience went on the stage, and um, the action took place. All right, so there was always that interest in playing with how we see, how we what you know, what our aspect is on the work. For me, certainly, and um, so, so that was kind of the first stage of the company, um, which when I keep going, I keep, yeah. So that was kind of the first stage of the company, and I suppose like that, that there were um, uh, fall off from people who were there. It kind of went into a stage that I suddenly was doing the I was directing the productions, um, and um, so it was 1991 when the company started, and in uh, since so we were doing loads of productions early on because we had no money, which in some ways was easier because people nobody was being paid, so we were all at an age as well where we were committed to the medium and to making work, so that's what we were doing. Um, and I guess after a couple of years, I suppose, well, I think it was, so that was 19, in, in, I think it was 1994, we got our first funding from the Arts Council to do a production, it was just for a particular project, um, one production, um, 
Greek by Stephen Brokoff, which you did in um, the Everyman. Just before that, as well, actually, is that what had happened is that so we were doing these kind of relatively obscure European plays, um, which maybe allowed us to experiment a little bit more. And I think that there was, in the Irish theatre landscape at that time, there was, um, we were very anti the realism and naturalism that was predominant in the theatre landscape. So it was kind of uh, uh, fighting that. And over the, where the Theatre Development Centre is now, that that was the um, that was the uh, main performance space in the art centre before the church was there. So we kind of through we spent quite a bit of time there. Um, in so far as that we we with the there was a new company of people because we had received a community employment scheme, um, which meant that people, rather than being on the dole, they were getting a little bit more, but they were officially um, allowed to be part of Crockett Rocket Theatre Company. So we had another company there so, who were employed effectively, employed as being a bit uh, far-fetched in uh, 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 that description, but we had access to a bunch of people to make work. And so we went through a process of not using any texts. Um, we devised work over a year or two, both as kind of lunchtime things, little mini things, where we might have six of them in a lunchtime on a Friday, or um, we'd book the theatre to do shows in there, um, however long, not knowing what they were going to be. And they were really awful, all of them, actually. And, um, but what was really great was that we were very much experimenting with form and how we were going to make work. So that then we went back to a text, which was this Greek Stephen Burkhoff piece, is that we felt very kind of liberated in how we would make it. Um, and at that time, so was Ender Walsh was in that. As an actor, he was working with graffiti, so he was kind of knocking around with us also. So I think it was 1994. Um, and uh, so that was the first time I received kind of acknowledgement in a national scale in terms of funding. Was it later that year or the next year? I can't remember, but we did a very successful production of A Clockwork Orange, um, which I directed that, uh, that we did in a very famous nightclub, uh, Sir Henry's, which was a, um, which was kind of really progressive in terms of dance music, house music, that it was one of the first in England, UK, where uh, 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 that, that, the, uh, that this music got so popular. Um, and of course it was associated very much at the time as uh, uh, ecstasy, and there had been some um, so there's kind of a fear factor about the place, you know, people were, uh, this is this den of this mad music and drug taking. And um, so, uh, but, as I said, with the clock burns, that, you know, dealing with youth culture or subcultures and the Korova milk bar. So we spoke with Sean O'Neill, who ran the place at the time, and we would have been familiar with the place anyway, but uh, we, uh, we decided to do that production in there as a prominent piece, and I suppose what I did is that, that the, the material, as in the play, its relevance in a contemporary context and the association of at the space in which it would take place was the first kind of really successful um, uh, site-specific work that we had done, where all those elements came together. So, that was kind of stage two then, I think. Um, so stage three then was that Enda came onto the company with me, because he and I, we had done, we done, um, 
We had done a, a version of his before Clockwork Orange of a Christmas carol that we did up in the Cork City Jail. But he and I were working well together and um, uh, I was very interested in his work as, as a writer and as a maker. Um, and so the kind of bigger company was coming to a, an end really and um, there were less of us there. And N and I became joint artistic directors of the company at that time. Um, and so Enda was, we, this was the nature of the work that we really hadn't been, we hadn't brought the work, although albeit that we were getting some recognition outside of Cork, nationally in terms of funding and stuff like this, our work hadn't been seen outside of Cork. So um, we, well, that's not true. We had done the Ginger Ale Boy and a play of Enda's in um, the Project Arts Centre with Fiat McKinney at the time when he was artistic director there. But and there was a very definite strategy to make a very tourable show, which Enda was going to write, which turned out to be Disco Pigs. So we did that in '96, and I think that, like, as a phase, that that kind of went on for. So we're still a very small company. That play was incredibly um, successful um, uh, over a long period of time, insofar as that we did it here in 1996, was it? Uh, um, in the Trisco, where the Theatre Development Centre is now. And then it went to the um, Dublin Fringe Festival, where it was a huge success as well. The success of it there led to it going to Edinburgh the following year, uh, the Bush Theatre in London. It going there led to international festivals seeing it and uh, uh, programming it and um, uh, uh, an appetite for it to travel. So we ended up all over the world with them over um, a, a couple of years. Now, with the scale of the company and the number of us and how much we had in terms of value is that we weren't doing anything else except disco things for two or three years, um, which was kind of which was great because we were seeing the world and we were on tour and it was great crack. But I remember we came back to Cork in 1989, I think, and we did a production, a Sarah Kane play, um, Fader's Love, just over here actually, what, what, the, what was the Camden Palace, what was the Atkins Garden Centre, just the other side of the bridge on this side here. And nobody came to see the show, well not nobody, but the audiences were really small. And suddenly there was the realisation is that we had been, we hadn't been in the city for a long time, so we had kind of gone over people's consciousness or we, people weren't as aware of the company as they had been because we had been uh, 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 We've been disco pigging around the world. So that was a bit of a wake up call, and I think we kind of felt. What did we do after? Yes, we did, we did Fader's Love, and then we did Mr. Man, Emma's play. And at that time, I think that it, it, with Disco Pigs, well, that, that play was so, so successful that it really elevated. And as a writer as well, so that he, you know, there were relationships with theatres all over the world as well for him. And he, I think he was getting, he then was from Dublin initially, and I think in fact that he had kind of had enough of Cork as well, really, at that stage, and was interested in, you know, spreading his wings a little. So for me, I wanted to stay and I wanted to keep making the work, but I wanted to make it bigger, I wanted to make it uh, more visible. And I was just getting people back to, 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 to see it. So I think, so one of the first kind of large scale things was that for the millennium in 2000 is that we did um, a passion play up Patrick's Hill, which I don't know, do you know Patrick's Hill? So it was up there into the Vale, and it was a really spectacular evening, and I think it was 5,000 people could come and see it. It was a free event. We'd secured national funding to do it, and it was a um, a real, it had a real imprint on the city and created much bigger awareness of the company again, I think. So then the, then the following year, we did um, Midsummer Night's Dream in um, 
the Fitzgerald's Park, which was again a really fantastic production. Actually, it was really really worked well in there in the space, and um, yeah, it was it, um, it, it was great. So we continued then to uh, I think what's the sequence of stuff after that? Oh, that was yeah. I can't remember what we did. That was the one. What did we do after Midsummer Night's Dream? We kept doing site specific work anyway, and I suppose like that the next so that and that was that became very much um, our trademark nationally and locally. And I suppose it's that whole thing of site specific versus you know, I think that the better word is site responsive because we would make the work in the place that the site that we had chose chosen and um, we were responding to that site and uh, 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 using the architecture, geography of whatever the site was in rehearsal to make it work with the, with the material we were working on. Um, and, I mean, you know, I suppose again, just to try to marry the, um, um, the content with the location as well. Because they're very kind of, you know, successful production as well. Um, losing Steam, which had the elements of, I think it was 2004, um, which had elements of uh, a race scandal play that I commissioned him to write about the closure of Fords and Dunlops, which were the two biggest employers in Cork, and it was the previous recession to the last one, that both of those closed in um, the kind of mid to late 80s. And at the same time, there was a really interesting music scene of kind of indie, uh, uh, in, and, and a very famous uh, place called The Ark, where bands have became a real national thing. And, so I got I got onto a band or I got onto the, the band called called Five Got to See on Attacks. There was another band called Mean Features, and members of those bands got together to play some of that music live in the show, uh, in in the location of the old factory. So so that was two thousand four, and at that time, I suppose the next thing that kind of happened was um, Cork was European Capital of Culture in two thousand and five. Um, and uh, we applied, there was open call, so at that stage my interest obviously was site specific work, so I put it to them that we would program site specific work in the city for, for the summer, for, for companies, um, which we did, including ourselves. So, uh, Theatre Via Progressi from Poznan and Poland, who were amazing, a uh, company I'd seen before. They came, uh, Company Jean uh, uh, from France, who were huge scale work that they did a production of Victor Frankenstein. Um, and Gridiron from Edinburgh, who have a history of making more intimate site specific works. And we did a production of The Merchant of Venice, which kind of went all over the city. So the imprint again on the city was huge with those uh, 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 productions they were free events, that they were ticketed but free, and it was a really successful part of 2005. So, we then, I suppose, or at that stage as well, just because it does influence, so you know, I think it was half a million, I think we got it at that time to program that event. Uh, um, you know, which 125,000 for each company isn't, isn't enormous money by any stretch of the imagination for the scale of the work for some of it. But um, what did happen was that, um, so we were making that, that work, uh, we did a big production of uh, The Tempest the following year. So it's very, you know, getting 500 people a night to that. Um, and then uh, probably my favourite show, Wojciech, which we did on a huge scale and on an island in, in the Hall of Poland, but the naval base, the Irish naval base. Um, and then we did, in 2008, we did this, another enormous production of the Hairy Ape. Um, there's, few, there's footage of all of those, I think, as well, that Finn probably has that if you want to see that. And our kind of funding was climbing with us, and we were kind of, but then, I suppose what happened in 2008, 2009 was that the um, economy collapsed and with it 
collapsed to arts funding. So suddenly the scale of our work was huge, but it also cost a lot of money to make. So what was happening then is that there was a kind of a um, cull of independent theatre companies around that time because the Arts Council didn't have money, the country didn't have money, it was, you know, the banks didn't have money, nobody had money. So funding was one of the things that was going to be, uh, you know, that we were all aware. So suddenly it just collapsed the arts economy and um, so we then had to begin to rethink about making other work. So it meant scaling down and uh, thinking about going back into theatres because site responsive work is so much more expensive to make than going into an equipped theatre because you have to equip the place you're going to. It's not already equipped. Um, so you've got to hire and buy and install and take down at night time with crew and stuff for this have become it's a much more expensive. So so the next phase of the company post the kind of things that I mean, we did a couple of Shakespeare's in the opera house. Um, and I guess for me, it wasn't the work I wanted to be making. I mean, it was kind of, but you were, the whole thing as I suppose at that stage is that everybody was looking over their shoulder to see, were you going to get the bullet next as the company that was going to be gone? So you're just trying to keep going. And, um, So after that couple of years, so that would have been kind of 2010, 2011, maybe, is that I kind of I wanted to make more site specific work, um, and began to make smaller scale site specific work, things like gentrification in the old savings bank, how these desperate men talk, both in a much place as well, um, and um, so kind of pleased with. At that time, then as well, I suppose that the, you know, that the, uh, um, the funding began to kind of increase a little as well. Um, we were making that work, and also what we did was um, uh, now we did a couple of I think Pat McCain play over in the theatre as well. So it was kind of between the two smaller. Smaller um, uh, site specific works, site responsive works, and maybe new writing in smaller theatres, which you know, which was more affordable to make, really. Um, but I suppose then, you know, it seems like it was a capital culture two thousand and five, the millennium in two thousand. Um, then there was the the. Uh, the anniversary of the 1916, in 2016, so we kind of commissioned Pat McCabe to work with me and Mel Mercier on that, which we did, and we received kind of bigger funding for that as well, to be able to do a bigger production than we had done for some time on, 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 on that, up in the Elizabethan Ford. Um, and I suppose then I kind of felt that the, from the collapse, the kind of got into going back into the theatre, to beginning to do smaller things, to do 2016, that we were kind of in a position to return to making uh, 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 the bigger work. Um, so, we, so the bigger work and the smaller work. So like with a really great year in 2018, was it 2017? I can't remember the years that where we did the same and far away in one year. The same thing of quite an intimate um, theatre piece. Well, it, we didn't do it in the theatre, but uh, 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 it was uh, an intimate two-handed piece that we did in an intimate way in the decommissioned prison in Rathmore Road, in what was what looked like a mess there, uh, as in uh, uh, the uh, prison officer's mess. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so we did that, which was kind of a really intimate for maybe, I think that the audience was something around 50 people, to huge scale, far away, which was this kind of huge vista of Spike Island, where the audience had to get a boat across to... Uh, um, so that then is kind of where it felt that the work had kind of 
making the decision to go back to the site specifically work that it, um, it had worked, does work, and uh, uh, that that's where uh, uh, I guess just the last couple of years that there's been change in the thinking in the arts council and there's very much a, um, a uh, um, an appetite by the arts council to ensure that work that is funded is seen by more people. So what we're kind of navigating at the moment is because previously in terms of the site responsive work is that it could only really be seen in the place that it was made. Now, um, this kind of way thinking for that sort of the same as Good Galway uh, uh, for the Arts Festival this year. Um, so I think one of the first times that we uh, uh, um, have done that in a long time. Actually, yeah, we did one actually of a request program in, in one of the years, I couldn't remember, with Eileen Walsh, who's in uh, uh, the same also, which is a one woman, sh one -woman show. Francie for Kretz, um, and we um, toured that. It took place in an apartment to a, a Dublin Data Festival, Galway Arts Festival, Kilkenny Arts Festival, Belfast, that festival at Queen's, where we, we adapted apartments um, to do that. Uh, how do you choose sites for your productions? Uh, well, I suppose it's got to be a connection to the material. I mean, in general, it's you know, and each production has particular uh, requirements. No, no, not, not requirements. There's tone or ideas in in them that you feel can be helped or supported by the site in which you take attempt which it takes place. So you know, on a site yesterday, the old waterworks um, uh, and thinking about that and why it takes place there is that the world of the play The Small Things is very old, you know, it's about tape recorders and like alarm clocks rather than mobile phones or things so I wanted to get a world. So I mean like when, when you're when you're choosing a site it's got to be it's like when I was speaking about like it's about how it connects to the content of the piece, or how it comments on it, um, and also how it can support the kind of interpretation that you have of the particular text. It's got to; they've got to work together. You know, they've got to um, help. It's a, it's 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 the biggest design decision. Decision said because, you know. Um, I mean, I suppose like what, what the sites do, and what they're so amazing is that sometimes you can find things that you, you would never ever be able to create, you know, um, whether it be an island or the waterworks or Hoboland, which is another island actually, or or else if there is resonance in the place, you know, um, of the Fords and Dunlops that are actually doing it in the Fords and Dunlops factory, so certainly that adds so much of a um, resonance for the audience because you're actually in the place about the thing that you're talking about. Um, um, you know, for far away is that this is one of the, this was the biggest prison in the world where that really supported the content of that particular play, you know, so. There's resonance of the ghosts of that, and you're witnessing material connected to that in the world of it. Um, you know, with the same, for example, which we'll be doing later in this year, is that, is that you know that, that that's very that play very much is uh, um, kind of occupied with the idea of people who have been sidelined by society who have been given up on in terms of either the more progressive therapy route so that it's about, a, about a girl who has been in a really awful dysfunctional family is damaged isn't very safe secure in her own head and um, so 
the world in which she's in is very much institutionalised, so the place in which you want the play to take place should reflect that in some way then. Now, you know, sometimes you can be more poetic about it insofar as that it was a prison, which is, they're not in prison, but that is very much an institution, as opposed to if you look at the idea of um, the uh, losing steam, which is the, the closures and fours, uh, fours and doubles, that that was a more practical place rather than the poetic. So it's different every uh, 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 um, every time, um, and uh, so. But but there's the initial impulse and reflex reaction to what that is, as in the site that you're going to you're going to, and then something else happens then which is when you reside in that site it suddenly becomes more familiar to you and suddenly you begin to notice things that you hadn't noticed on your first visit which suddenly can become really important or useful or that you begin to play with the site or it becomes your your friend in which you can begin to uh, 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 say yeah that was great there let's try this up there, or let's light it, or whatever it may be. But I suppose the, the, the biggest question is that there needs to be some connection between the site and the material, in, in whatever way that might be. <clears throat> and the last question. Yeah. What are the main challenges of doing site-responsive theatre? Um, I mean, there are practical things, you know, um, and often if you think, if you had thought about those, you'd never do it. Like say for example, going back to Spike Island, is that the site was incredible and it was going to work for the thing and uh, you, but then you realise because you can only get there by boat, that all your, so that's fine, we have resolved how we would get there how the audience would get there, but all our equipment, because it wouldn't, wasn't going to fit on the ferry, the kind of per people ferry. So suddenly barges and stuff like this, you know, had to be. And also then how do they get from the landing point of the island to where we needed to, in terms of where. So, so I think, you know, there's always health and safety issues as well. You know, you run into things like sound with a big issue last year with the residents nearby or a place we where we did the production. Um, and I mean, it can you know say about the cost of it as well as the fact that you know that you um, you know if you're having to put stuff up and bring it down if they're in public spaces, that that can become really costly. Because it means you've got to have crew there every night, as opposed to the theatre manager locking the theatre. Um, but I think they're all kind of practical things. If you didn't have the practical, practical things, it'd be amazing. Do you know what I mean? Uh, um, because the um, <coughs> like the reality is that I find it hard to think of the difficulties of making sense of other than the practical, and of course sometimes the weather as well. If you're outdoors, that you know. Um, it means you can't rehearse, it means you've got to take stuff down, it means that that um, sequence of getting stuff up and down again um, has to happen again. Um, I guess we can't get it. But, um, yeah, so that's it's mostly logistical, practical things. But I think like the, what's really is that we have been incredibly lucky with people like the city council here and other people who have handed over public spaces or their spaces to us, whereby there's been no, you know, like the amount of support. Because as I say, it would be next to impossible to um, the. The problems are just, they're not, you know, it's not like, oh God, it's awful, okay, not, it's just all the practical things, no. Mm. So anything else? <laughs> no, thank you very much, it was very helpful. Okay, good. <laughs>